Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 93. On today's show, I've got a special guest for you. It's Craig Manson. He is a well-known genealogy blogger of the Genia Blogie blog. And among other things, um, in his great eclectic background and experience, we'll be talking about genealogy, but he'll also be sharing some real inspirational thoughts that you should never give up. And so I, I, I wrote about that in about five different segments because I wanted people to know that these things are possible. And every time I hear a story like that, I'm inspired. Mm-hmm. So I want to inspire people not to give up on, on things that they think are absolutely unknowable. And that's what I thought. I thought the name of my great-great-grandfather was absolutely unknowable. Really? And I would never learn it, but I did eventually. So. so that's coming up a little bit later in the show. I'm actually playing a bit of catch up around here in the Genealogy Gems office because last week I headed down to Los Angeles to speak at the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies annual conference. Uh, I gave three Google for Genealogy presentations there. Um, In addition to being on a panel presentation at one of the breakfasts talking about genealogy blogging, podcasts, and social networking. I covered podcasting, and they had Thomas McKenty there of geniabloggers.com. He was talking about social networking for genealogists. And, of course, Shelley Dardashti of the Tracing the Tribe blog. She was there talking about blogging and genealogy blogging. It's always fun to get together with Shelley and Thomas. Uh, we did something similar at the Jamboree in June, kind of a blogging summit. So it was kind of like old home week at the um, conference. Shelly blogged about our little session in her July 13th, 2010 post. It's called IAJGS 2010 Breakfast with the Bloggers. So I will have a link in the show notes for you so you can check that out. And I met a lot of new folks and I want to welcome all of you who are new listeners who attended the IAJGS conference. I am so glad that you're tuning in. And if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be receiving your first edition in the in your email inbox here very soon. And to find the show notes that I do talk about here on the podcast, um, just go to the website at genealogygems.com, click the word podcast, you'll find there in the menu, and follow the links to episode 93 or any episode that you happen to be listening to that you want to check out the additional notes and pictures and videos and things that are included in the show notes. I really enjoyed um, the trip to L.A., partially because I was lucky enough to have my husband, Bill, come with me. And he can't always do that because of his job, but this was a long weekend, so he was able to pull it off. And we had a lot of fun because the conference was held at the brand new J.W. Marriott at L.A. Live in downtown L.A. It's a whole new complex. And I got to tell you, it's kind of like the Times Square of Los Angeles. It's pretty amazing. Uh, Flashing lights, video screens everywhere, indoors and outdoors. Um, Tons of fantastic restaurants. And, of course, the Marriott was something else. Uh, It was like a hotel for the, the new generation of rat packers is the best way I can describe it. It was very chic, very modern. Um, So needless to say, we parked ourselves in the lounge that was kind of in the middle of the main floor behind uh, the reservation desk and just did a lot of people watching. And that was especially fun because they were holding, I guess it was a a pre-show reception for the ESPY Awards. Um, I guess they were going to take place the night right after we left. And I wasn't sure what the ESPYs were. So I was sitting there and I got my cell phone out and looked it up online. And it turns out the ESPYs are kind of the Academy Awards for sports. You know, for the sports industry, it's sponsored by ESPN, uh, which, of course, makes sense because there's a huge ESPN store. Or I, I guess it was a store. I don't know. If, I don't think it was a restaurant, uh, but there was a huge building there, um, part of the L.A. Live complex. So it makes sense. That they were having the ESPY Awards there. So I have no clue who most of the people were who were going in and out of the reception. But Bill tells me there were some very famous uh, people in the sports world there. So that kind of made for some uh, fun the last night that we were there. 
And of course, the IAJGS conference is really a huge event. Uh, Pretty amazing. It's pretty much a week long. And they not only had tons of classes and exhibits, but they also had a film festival of sorts going on. I want to thank Pamela Weisberger and her team for inviting me to speak. And uh, I only wish that I could have sat in on all the films they had there. A great collection. Um, One that really caught my eye. It was called Yoo-Hoo, Mrs. Goldberg. Now, I only spotted it in the huge program book that they gave us um, after I got home. But I went and checked out the website, and the film looks wonderful. And it really looks like a fascinating story. Now, I fully admit, I don't remember the TV show, The Goldbergs. It is It was before my time. Um, but the show originally came to radio in 1929. Um, But it had a long run and didn't finish on television until 1955. In fact, somebody was saying, uh, you know, before Oprah and before Martha, there was uh, Molly Goldberg. I guess she was kind of of that stature. So obviously a very popular show uh, on television, of course, and on radio. But it's the show's creator, writer and star that's really intriguing. Uh, Let me read you something here from the description uh, on the film's website. It says, From Aviva Kempner, maker of The Life and Times of Hank Greenberg, comes this humorous and eye-opening story of television pioneer Gertrude Berg. She was the creator, principal writer, and star of The Goldbergs, a popular radio show for 17 years, which became television's very first, I didn't realize this, very first character-driven domestic sitcom in 1949. Berg received the first Best Actress Emmy in history and paved the way for women in the entertainment industry. And according to the conference program, Gertrude Berg, who created the character Molly Goldberg in the show, was shown in polls to be the second most respected woman in America after Eleanor Roosevelt. A pretty big impact, it sounds like. The preview on the website kind of reminds me of one of my favorite movies, which is I Remember Mama. So I just had to check out one of the episodes, and I was able to purchase and download a single episode. I guess Amazon.com has a um, kind of a video on demand now. It was great. I could load, I think it was $1.99, and I downloaded the one episode, and it was really cute. I really enjoyed it. Um, so the movie Yoo-Hoo, Mrs. Goldberg, which I guess is what the neighbors were always calling out to Mrs. Goldberg. The movie has a very limited release, but you can see where it's playing at mollygoldbergfilm.org, where they also have the film uh, available for sale on DVD. I don't think it's out yet, but I think it's coming. So I really enjoyed that. I I wish I had seen it there at the conference, but um, I think it's coming to my neck of the woods here in October. So I'm going to see if I can track it down. Well, in other genealogy news, uh, there are things going on, announcements being made by some of the big websites out there. Uh, Genealogybank.com just announced that over the last month, they've added millions of family history records to the website. The records include obituaries, birth and marriage announcements, and other helpful information. Uh, This is all coming from 186 newspapers in 40 states. I'm assuming they're saying that they've added that many new ones to the site. So if you are looking for a particular paper, it would be worth checking to see if they have it now. Um, Of course, the Genealogy Gems podcast is an affiliate of Genealogy Bank. So what that means is if you go to the show notes and you click the link there for Genealogy Bank and you head over there and it turns out that they have what you need and you decide to become a member, you're going to automatically financially support this free podcast at the same time. And of course, it doesn't cost you anything extra. So we do appreciate so much when you use the links. It really helps cover the cost of uh, keeping the free show free, which is our goal. And uh, there, there's some news over at Ancestry.com. Uh, First, on July 14th, they released the new Australian Birth, Marriage, and Death Collections, which contains 14 million names between 1788 and 1985. Now, Angela Gardner is um, one of the staff members from Ancestry.com.au, and and she talks about this new collection in her recent blog post over at the Ancestry.com.au blog. So I'll have a link um, for you that takes you directly to her blog post so you can check out more information about those records. 
And, uh, oh, next, Ancestry.com has announced the official closing of the acquisition of Genline.se. Of course, that's the leading Swedish family history website. They have purchased it. So the specifics of the acquisition um, are available in their press release, and I will have that. uh, That happened July 15th of 2010. So I'll have that in the show notes for you as well. And finally, Ancestry recently released a new version of the Ancestry.com Tree to Go iPhone application in the iTunes App Store. Of course, you'll find the Genealogy Gems podcast app there as well and a couple other family history apps. Um, The Tree to Go iPhone app enables you to log into your Ancestry.com account from anywhere to access your tree. You can edit information, you can upload photographs, even add a long lost family member uh, that you find along the way. So the new iPhone 1.1 version of the app now has improved performance. Uh, It's supposed to handle trees with more than 2000 people and it's supposed to provide the ability to delete a person from your tree, which was something that they needed to add. So um, you can check that out. Again, I'll have a link for you in the show notes. Well, that's it for the news. And next, we're going to hear from you. We'll do that over at the mailbox. Well, here in the mailbox, I just want to share with you a quick email that I received from Barry Helfand. Um, He says, at your Google Earth lecture yesterday, you stated that you can provide me with the information on where to find Canadian homestead records. And what Barry is referring to is he attended one of my classes at the IAJGS conference. And we were talking about, of course, Google Earth for genealogy. You know, I have the the DVD out on it. And uh, we were doing a one hour class kind of covering some of the highlights of that. Uh, And of course, all the videos that are on the DVD are also part of premium membership. And um, anyway, we were talking about it, and he was saying, gosh, I wonder if this could apply to Canada. And it got me wondering the same as well. So um, I did some checking. And indeed, in Canada, they did have land patents. So uh, in the show notes, I'm going to have a link for you to the web page at the Archives Canada website um, that's about the land patents there in Canada, uh, which includes a link to the Western Land Grants database. And that database uh, webpage also includes information for locating land grants for other provinces that are not actually included in the database. So I'll have those for you because they did have land patents. And then as we cover in the Google Earth video series, there's a website that you can go to where you can input the latitude and longitude and and the land data about a, a parcel of property, a land patent. And it will take you into Google Earth and it will plot it out for you. But right now, that website only covers um, U.S. land grants. So uh, I checked with the website developer, and um, he said that they're working on it. They just finished Texas, and they're hoping to launch in the wintertime, in winter 2010, maybe early 2011, uh, to be able to support Canadian coordinates. So for those of you who've uh, watched the videos in premium membership or have the DVD, uh, just know that that is coming. And if you have Canadian land patents in your uh, documents, hang on to them because hopefully you're going to be able to plot those coordinates and get them directly plotted into Google Earth here in the next oh, maybe six to eight, ten months. So stay tuned. Well, that's it for the mailbox. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing our first gem with you. And that is my conversation with genealogy blogger Craig Manson. Roots Magic 4 has been completely rewritten and is now even more powerful and makes building your family tree easier than ever. I love it. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer, quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard, create customized reports, and best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with the Roots Magic to go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history, publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even generate websites automatically from your data. To download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 4, head to rootsmagic.com. 
See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at RootsMagic.com. Are you looking for a way to get even more genealogy gems that will power boost your research, inspire your creativity, and give you the motivation that you need to tackle that brick wall? Well, become a Genealogy Gems Premium member. You'll get two extra members-only episodes every month, packed with great information that you can use right away, an instructional video series walking you through the best internet tools step-by-step. Our current series is called Google, a gold mine of genealogy gems. And in each episode, you can follow along with me as I show you online how to get the most out of Google. If you enjoy the Genealogy Gems podcast, then you're going to love being a premium member. But don't just take my word for it. Here's what your fellow podcast listeners have to say. This is Melissa Parker in Tennessee. I'm just calling to let you know how much I'm enjoying your Genealogy Podcast Premium Edition. I especially love the handwriting analysis with Paula Sassy. And all the tips and information that you give is just so wonderful. I would encourage anyone to become a member of your Genealogy Gems Podcast Premium. To become a premium member and start reaping the benefits right away, go to genealogygems.tv and click the Join Today button. Genealogy Gems Premium Membership. It's where you belong. Well, I'm really looking forward to this gem because I have been wanting to have Craig Manson on the show for quite some time. And recently at the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree down in Burbank, California in June of 2010, I got my chance. Um, Craig was gracious enough to set some time aside. It's hard. There's so many classes, so many great activities going on. But Craig was a dear. He um, set some time aside. We got a chance to sit down and really talk about his career and his blog and his work in genealogy. It's interesting. When you go to Craig's blog, which is called Genia Blogi, it's called, uh, his subtitle is An Occasional Journey Chronicling the Author's Adventures in Genealogy and the Exploration of His American Family of Families. And there he talks about himself. His profile here says, I literally have a checkered past. My ancestors include African slaves and Native Americans, as well as members of America's most prominent colonial and antebellum era families. That's why America's history is very personal to me. And it's so true. But not only does this checkered past apply to his family lines, but it really applies to Craig's life. He has such an eclectic mix of skills and experiences, things that have all kind of come together, and he brings them to the Genia Blogi blog and, and kind of incorporates them into the work that he does on his own family, as well as the information that he's sharing with his readers. So with that, rather than me tell you any more about Craig, let's hear from Craig himself. about you. I realized last night I have done so many different weird things in my life that I finally decided what I wanted to be when I grow up and that's Lisa Louise Cook. And I never realized that until the other night. <laughs> what the world would make you realize a thing like that? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think I mentioned once that I was in radio a long time ago and uh, the, the podcast is the next evolution of radio it and uh, uh, I, I realized that for a long time I've been thinking that I needed to get back into radio, you know. I, I don't know that I'm going to do it, but uh, it's something that's certainly been in the back of my mind for about five or ten years now. Yeah. So. Well, I could see it with your voice. It would be great in, in radio. Well, you know, and the, the really amazing thing about it is that podcast levels the playing field. Yeah. You know, anybody, we were talking, I was talking to some other podcasters, and they were saying, oh, my gosh, you know, my podcast little icon is right there next to yeah. the, you know, he does a finance one. He says, I'm right next to Susie Orman's, yeah. you know, and, and right. I'm doing that in my basement or whatever. Yeah, that, that, that is a cool thing. And, and uh, as I said, I think it's, 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 it's the next evolution that mm-hmm. where, where we're going. And uh, um, when the days that I was in radio, I think back on that. And it's really the most fun thing that I've ever done in my life. And 
that you it enjoy was, the most? Yeah, really, absolutely, other than genealogy. <laughs> now, I first did radio in college and got the, the 4 a.m., 5 a.m. shift, yeah. whatever, that nobody else yeah. wanted. Yeah. And um, when did you first know that you had an interest, and in, how did you get started in that? Well, I um, actually had gotten started in, in television uh, when I was 16, believe it or not. Really? And um, they, uh, I lived in Monterey, and the Monterey Peninsula Cable wanted to cover high school sports. And they wanted, in particular, to cover wrestling for some odd reason. And uh, Speaking they, of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the wrestling team had won several league championships. Mm. And uh, so I was hired as the commentator for uh, wrestling on the, on the cable channel. Monterey. Wow, yeah. at 16. Yeah, yeah, 16. Awesome. Yeah, that was cool. And then later I went to college. I was in my college radio station and did everything you could do on a college radio station. I came back to Monterey and worked a little bit, uh, not much, very little bit actually, at KMBY, which was a big AM rocker in Monterey. Not yeah. a big AM rocker, but an AM rocker, which had always been my aspiration to, to do. And I, I got the same thing. I, I, I did the news at, they had what they called 2020 news, 20 minutes after the hour. Mm-hmm. And I did the news 20 minutes after 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 a.m. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that was after covering the city council and the planning commission. <laughs> Which go late into the night in, in our neck of the woods. Right. <laughs> oh, funny. So, but you ended up going into something else, and and let's talk about it because I was we were talking in the blogger summit, and I was saying, boy, Craig Manson's brand is that he's just so eclectic, and you have this wide range of varied expertise, which I'm guessing comes from a, a driving curiosity in a lot of things. Well, it could come from that, or it could come from ADD, or oh. <laughs> you know, simply yeah. having a checkered past. <laughs> to call it the wide range of curiosity myself. <laughs> Actually, I think that's, that, that's what it is. I, yeah. I, a lot of things interest me, and, and I, I want to know how they work and, and, and what's behind them and, and uh, who the people are that are involved in them. And so I've, I've, I've done a lot of different things. I was in the Air Force uh, on active duty for about 13 years, and, and in the course of that, I did a lot of unusual things, too. And, and, uh, and then I've I've been a college professor outside of, of the Air Force of uh, a, a couple of different places. And, um, gosh, what else? I've been a lobbyist. That's when I was 14, by the way. 14? <laughs> I was the youngest re- registered lobbyist in the state of New Mexico. What were you lobbying? 18-year-old vote. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> and you weren't even 18. <laughs> what a go-getter. <laughs> well, it was just it was one of those weird things that, that happened, you know, and... And uh, then I, I, if you, on, on my, in my blog, there's a page that says about me. Yeah. And it says in there, it lists all these bizarre things that I've done. And at the end, it says something about, I don't remember how I put this. Uh, oh, yeah, then there was a time I played uh, major, one time, the, oh, yeah, then there was a time I played uh, professional baseball, baseball. for Stop one it. day. Yeah. And it was one day. One day, right. <laughs> and it's in the Dodgers organization, too. Really? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what happened there was I had been the bat boy for the Dodgers Farm Club in Albuquerque for for uh, a year. And in the last game of the season, the manager was Del Crandall, who was a great all-star catcher for the Milwaukee Braves before he uh, uh, retired. And uh, we, were getting our, we were just getting pounded in the last game of the season. We were going to finish last in the Western Division of the Texas League. And... Uh, Del Crandall said, why don't you go in there as a pinch runner for so-and-so? And so I did. And the worst thing happened, you know, the worst thing that can happen to any runner, I took too big a lead off of first base and got picked off by the El Paso's pitcher. And that was the end of the game. So, <laughs> And that's how you went down in history. Picked off. That's right. Oh. Picked off. And you were also a lawyer, yes. correct? Yes. yes. And that certainly has found its way into your, your blog, as right. all these different experiences have. Right, right. And um, actually, I, I want to do more on, on, on genealogy and the law, um, because I think there's more to be said. And um, um, I, I think, actually, those have been some of the most popular posts that I've done. And uh, I enjoy that aspect of it. And uh, copyright is certainly part of it. Privacy and defamation is another part of it. Uh, but there are other things like contracts and 
things of that nature for uh, for people who are in the business of genealogy. Absolutely. In fact, I was doing um, a class on, I think it was Friday, and it was saving your research from destruction. Right. And I introduced the idea of a genealogical research directive to attach to your will. And then also, many people didn't realize that when you do a deed of gift to an archives or a library, you really are entering into a contract. Yes. And each one of them has their own version of it. And uh, things like, oftentimes they'll write into it, look, if we decide that real estate you know, space, shelf space needs to be used for something else, we can toss your material. Right. And people don't realize it. It is the real thing. So it's on all different areas, isn't it? Yeah, it, it certainly work. is. It absolutely is. And recently I've been dealing with a situation uh, advising a person who uh, had posted something in, uh, in a blog that attracted the attention of a, of a company that uh, wants to use it as, as a, a logo, basically, on on something, and uh, so uh, we've been talking about licensing and things of that oh, nature, too. Okay. Exactly, because again, that playing field gets leveled, and right. you, an individual could be working with a major company yeah. on something and <laughs> be yeah. faced with those kinds of questions. Yeah. That, that, that's exactly yeah. right. So, yeah. So, um, genealogy in the law has got uh, a long way to go, I think. Um, I, my goal is to keep it simple. You know, I don't. <laughs> Don't want Thank to get, you. <laughs> don't want to get it too complicated, you know, and um, um, because that's not what people need to be spending their time on. They need to be spending their time on doing their research and doing their business and so forth. So, but another area that interfaces with that is open records, which I've written a lot about as well. Yes. And uh, and I uh, I am an advocate for keeping um, uh, open records as much as we possibly can. I understand the privacy needs. But I think we've overreacted to some extent with respect to privacy. And, um, you know, uh, there are some states that keep um, marriage uh, records uh, sealed for 125 years. Well, that's ridiculous, right. you know. <laughs> right. And uh, so there needs to be more advocacy in that area. That's a challenge, though, because they're not only state by state, but it's county by county. Are there things that can be done at the federal level to try to address that without having to fight every fight? Well, um, possibly, but that's fraught with its own set of uh, hazards as well. I think uh, my point of view is ideally it's done at the state level. There should not be separate rules in every county. Yeah. And um, if, if it were done that way, that would reduce the burden on a lot of people. Uh -huh. And uh, to the extent that I can, I'm, I'm out there advocating for that and uh, uh, helping people with open records issues. Excellent. So... Are there ways for individual genealogists, because I'm sure this is kind of perking the ears of some people, are there? Are you guys organized? Is there something that people can do in their own community to help with that kind of advocacy? Well, there are things they can do. Um, uh, are we organized? Well, in a sense, yes. In a sense, no. You know, <laughs> like a lot of things. Uh, the Association of Professional Genealogists has got an open records uh, task force or committee or something. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not remembering what they're calling it, but... They, they are involved to a great extent. But it, what it comes down to is people making a difference themselves. You know, you've got to go and talk to your county clerk and write your state representatives and make a compelling case that uh, these records are public records, and there's a reason that they were made public. Uh, the public has a right to know who, who, who is getting married and, and, uh, and when children are born and, and so forth. Uh, to the extent that it does not endanger someone's privacy unduly. Uh, that's what makes us a community, you know, that, that we, and we don't know these things anymore because there are too many of us and we're too far apart and we don't have records that we can easily access. And so that, that's just something that's contributed to the erosion of community. When you could look in the newspaper and see that so-and-so was getting married and so-and-so had a baby and so forth, um, and it's just not that easy to do anymore. So true. That's so true. And it's interesting how quickly it changes yes. our whole perception of the thing. Right, right. What are, what are the kinds of things are you really passionate about that you're talking about on your blog? I know that you cover a wide range, but what are some of your more recent ones that you can point people to that they may want to go check out? Well, one of the things is um, research I'm passionate about and, and uh, getting it right. Um, right. And... Uh, um, recently I wrote, well, recently has, is a relative term, but I think about five or six months ago I wrote about 
breaking down a brick wall that I had had for a long time. And uh, the interesting thing is that um, Amy Coffin reminded me the other night that uh, I had talked to her about it a year ago here at Jamboree, and, um, and, and we'd kind of scoped out some possibilities. And then it was about um, several months after that that I finally broke through the brick wall. And so I, I, I wrote about that in about five different segments because I wanted people to know that these things are possible. And every time I hear a story like that, I'm inspired. So I want to inspire people not to give up on, on things that they think are absolutely unknowable. And that's what I thought. I thought the name of my great-great-grandfather was absolutely unknowable. Really? And I would never learn it, but I did eventually. So. My gosh. And I know I was just up at the OGS conference, and I was listening to a speaker who was talking about the importance of, you know, he sits down and he reads through the NGS journal, you know, quarterly, and reads those case studies. And I think reading blogs is a a nice, quick way to see real-life examples. So we're not only inspired, but, you know, we may be picking up on tips that we hadn't thought of. Well, that's exactly right. And and that's one of the reasons why I read blogs, is to see, see what other folks are doing and how they're doing it. Uh, to to find things that I think are unknowable but really are knowable. I think that's a great thing. I I was saying the other day at the Blogger Summit that I think there's a greater sense of collaboration in the world now than than there has been in a long time. And I think that blogging has been part of that uh, because bloggers have shared so much with the community and with each other, and um, that's the way to get it done. And your guest the other day, uh, Susan Russo Adams, was talking about uh, how much she enjoyed working at, with a team on yes. uh, who do you think you are. That's, that's a great thing. Uh, uh, I had a group of uh, cousins who coalesced around uh, uh, a particular issue in one of our family lines uh, as a result of having read something in my blog, and we worked through an issue that had plagued researchers for decades, really? and we finally solved it. Right. So I like that sort of collaboration as well. And not only did it facilitate you guys being able to collaborate together, but think of all the the onlookers who were there in spirit and learning from what you were doing. I had a gentleman walk up to me yesterday, and he said, what is this thing about blogs? I've been hearing about genia bloggers. (laughs) And I started talking. He goes, no, no, no. See, the thing is, I want to find dead people. I don't want to talk. You know, I'm not looking for the, the live ones. How would you explain why people who are listening to this interview... Why should they be looking at genealogy blogs? Are they not just about what you're doing today, or are they about dead people? I mean, it, it was just funny, the perception he had. Right. Well, they, they vary, of course, but by and large, the, the goal is to be, a, as George Jeter calls himself, an evangelist for genealogy. Yeah. That's one thing, and to build enthusiasm about it. The other is to help people um, see one's own research and see what a person has done and and I learn a lot of good research tips from people who who write in that area on other blogs. The other thing is that products are are tested and reviewed and yeah. and that's a, a, a terrific thing I think for for the uh, for the genealogy community. There is no one single genealogy consumer reports. And so you have <laughs> to read true. a couple of blogs to find some things out and and so that's why I would do it. If you're looking for dead people, you've got to know the tools and, and, and how to do it. Mm-hmm. I know. I love when Randy Seaver, he hears about something. And boy, he's got a blog that's you know pages long and has all the screenshots. And I don't have to hack around. I can kind of see somebody yeah. go through it. And, and then it facilitates discussion. Boy, don't forget to look at the comments, huh? Yeah. Because that discussion continues. Absolutely. And in fact, um, if you only read a blog post and you don't read the comments, you've sort of missed the point because <laughs> blogging is, is like a conversation yeah. and uh, the, the, the comments, uh, especially on a good blog that has a good readership, the comments contribute as much as the blogger's post does yeah. and uh, you don't want to miss that at all. Uh, in, we were talking about radio earlier and in that way blogging is a little different than radio because it's, it's a little more interactive, you know, and, le- and radio except for the call-in shows, is, is not quite that interactive. Uh, but, uh, but blogging has, uh, has become interactive. It's become collaborative. 
And this is a, all a very good trend as far as I'm concerned. Well, actually, I've been kind of taking a cue from the bloggers, and that is, is as more and more people write in to the show because they've listened, um, I, in a sense, do an audio version of the comments. Oh, that's so, great. you know, I'm always in the next episode or two reading the comments and the questions and then oftentimes putting the question out there and then another listener writes in. So, um, yeah, I love the, the conversation part of it. Now, here, I know that you are very well read. First of all, tell us the name and the address so they can find your blog. Okay. The name of my blog is Genia Blogi, which is like like the first half of genealogy, then with a B L O I B L O G I E uh, attached to it. And unfortunately, the uh, address is a little awkward. It's blog.geniablogi.net. Okay. So, um, and that's where it is. And uh, um, this, for the next couple of days, I've got a page up that lists some of the posts that, that I like the best. Um, although I find that as time goes by, some of the earlier ones I like less and less. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to put a link to the, the series that you were talking about earlier, too. And that brings me to my other question, which was, you're a well-read blogger, but who are you reading? Oh, um, well, I read Randy Seaver, for example. Um, I read Denise Olson. Uh, I read George Jeter. Um, I read... Um, um, I see, I'm going to get in trouble because I'm going to forget <laughs> somebody that... <laughs> that, uh, that I, uh, I've set you up. Yeah. Um, I read... Uh, um, uh, Professor Drew. Um, I read uh, John uh, Newmark. Um, I read Mark Olson, who has the uh, thinking genealogist, uh, and is very, very, is very thoughtful, <laughs> actually. Mm-hmm. And and th- there are many, many more that I that are not coming to mind at the moment. But, but you kind of do that scan, don't right. you, each day, just yeah, kind of see what the topics right. are catching your eye. Right, own. right. But I typically have. Um, 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 close to a thousand things in my Google Reader, and uh, uh, and so I have to go through them quickly and and so forth. Now I have to confess that in the last three months I have had back surgery, and I have not been. Uh, I've, I'm way behind. I probably have 2,600 things in my Google Reader right now, and and I've not posted very much on my own blog either. But um, um, I'm getting better, and every day and. Uh, um, this um, weird medical hiatus is going to be over soon. So. Glad to hear it. It's been really nice to have the little micro-blogging version of Facebook to kind of keep track of how you're doing, and everybody I know has uh, been interested. And it's, it's a great way to do those little quick updates without having to stress about a whole blog article. That's exactly right. You know, some people are, are always asking me, well, why are you on Facebook? But that's one of the reasons. Mm-hmm. And curiously enough, I, I, I went to Facebook originally because that's where uh, unclaimed uh, persons was going to be. Right. That, and, um, you know, I got so caught up in everything else on Facebook that I, I had time only to do a couple of the unclaimed person cases. And I, re- I regret that in some ways. But uh, I found that uh, Facebook is useful in a lot of other ways, too. So I have, for example, a have got two family research pages on Facebook uh, for people with the surnames that are involved there to come oh, okay. and take a look, uh, although there's not much there because it's uh, outside the, the, the genealogy community, it's hard to really pull in some, mm-hmm. some of the younger people who are on Facebook, and I hope to be able to think of ways to do that more and more. So that they know that that yeah. page is out there right. and exists. Yeah, that's right. very true. Right. But at least it's there. It's in waiting. You know, yeah. it could be found tomorrow. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I did have one young cousin, a young lady who had just graduated from Duke University in 2008. Uh, she discovered one of the surname pages, and and it turns out we are cousins. And <laughs> it, awesome. was, it was great. And uh, now we stay in touch, and uh, we share information back and forth. That's what I love about this, and that's what I love about coming to the Jamboree yeah. is, you know, we get to meet each other in person once in a while, <laughs> and uh, that's been a lot of fun. Well, i got to tell you, I'm so glad we've had a chance to sit down and talk and just 
catch up a bit and also help my listeners get to know you better because right. I think your blog is just terrific. I look forward to seeing you again at Jamboree, but maybe we'll get you back on the podcast and use that good voice of yours. Yeah. Yes, well, I think of myself as sort of the anti-Chris Haley because uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm as sober as he is manic and I don't sing. <laughs> Oh, but you do other things very well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Craig. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> oh, I want to just thank Craig Manson so much for joining us here on the podcast and um, sharing his thoughts and ideas and expertise in the area of genealogy. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk with him. I hope that you will go check out his blog at blog.geniablogie, and it's G-E-N-E-A-B-L-O-G-I-E dot com. Profile America, Tuesday, July 20th. Beginning on this date in 1874, the largest swarm of Rocky Mountain locusts ever recorded blackened the skies from the Dakotas to Texas and stripped farm fields in minutes. The swarm is estimated to have been 1,800 miles long and 110 miles wide. The locusts not only ate crops, but ate the wool off of living sheep and even brought trains to a halt. While not as large, similar swarms continued for several years. Then, in one of nature's greatest mysteries, they simply disappeared, never to return. Today's farmers don't have to contend with such massive attacks, but still have a large variety of pests to contend with. To ward off such damage, U.S. farmers use $10 billion worth of pesticides each year. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. You know, I love bringing these genealogical gems to you that help boost your research and build a strong family tree. And it's important to me to always have free podcasts available so that everyone can participate. If you enjoy these free shows and you would like to help me cover the costs of bringing them to you each week, there's a really easy way to do that that won't cost you a thing. By coming to my website at genealogygems.tv whenever you need to do some shopping online and accessing your favorite stores and websites through the links that you find on my site, you financially support the show. The price you pay is exactly the same, but Genealogy Gems receives a small percentage for referring you. It's just that simple. Amazon is one of my all-time favorite places to shop online. They have just about everything and at incredibly competitive prices. So next time you're looking for books, DVDs, software, electronics, apparel, pretty much anything at all, head to genealogygems.tv and click the Amazon ad that you find on the homepage or throughout the website. And these free podcasts will benefit by any shopping that you do and you will get the same super low prices. Everybody wins. So if you enjoyed the Genealogy Gems podcast and the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast, let your mouse do the shopping through the ads and links on the Genealogy Gems website, and together we'll keep new episodes coming for a long time to come. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 93. I want to say thank you so much to my special guest, Craig Manson of the Genia Blogi blog. Um, I hope that you will go check out his blog. I know you will enjoy it. And uh, stay tuned because the Family History Expo is coming up in October of 2010. And once again, we're putting together a live podcast episode and Craig is going to be there in person and one of my special guests. And we're going to be covering a wonderful online magazine called Shades of the Departed. So more information about the Family History Expo is coming up soon. It's going to be in Pleasanton, California uh, in early October, and I'll be there teaching Google classes and again doing the live show. So if you're in the area, I hope that you will come on by and be part of the live audience. And if you have any questions or comments, drop me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.